knew the words to that song, Hosanna in the highest. Good morning and welcome to church. Welcome to the house of the Lord here at the Salvation Army in MacArthur. We are so pleased that you can be with us, joining with us on this Palm Sunday, the first of our series this Easter. We're really thrilled that you can be joining us here in the room or joining us online. They'd seen the stories and they wanted to know more. And when the people heard that Jesus was on his way to Jerusalem, they, just let me grab my prop, they cut down branches from the trees around them and they grabbed the cloaks off their b- And Lord, if there's anyone here today who hasn't acknowledged that you are your, their Lord and King, we pray, Father, today that their hearts will be open. And so, Father, we thank you and praise you for this beautiful time together. And as we continue to worship you, we give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Please be seated. It too. What's it called? Palm Sunday. Palm Sunday. You all knew that, didn't you? You were going to say Palm Sunday? Okay, the band is going to help us with a great song called Hosanna in the Highest. We're going to have a ball with palms. And while we have fun and sing and wave our palms, I'd invite you to come and bring our offerings and our tithes forward to the sides here. Because even in our giving, it's an expression of praise, even in our giving. All right, let's sing. Thanks, band. After an introduction. You can grab another one if you want, Danny. No? All right, let's go. Meredith, do you want one? Yeah, you can have two. is going to lead us in our offering prayer and then we're going to head out to kids church how exciting thank you rita today we just say thank you because you are the king of kings and lord of lords in our hearts and as we brought our gifts of our offering today father we pray your blessing on it we thank you father that we can give and we can give from our hearts and so as this money is dispensed, we pray, Heavenly Father, that your wisdom will go with it. Mm. And we thank you, Father, because we can see evidence in our community of this money being used to extend your kingdom. And we pray this in the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, kids. Thank you. We can lay them down and out you go. Thank you. Have fun at Kids Church. Have a ball. Donate all the fellowship lunch. Yeah, great. Good.
Hosanna, save us. I'd like to invite Peter and Kay to come and join me on the platform now. And I'll explain some of our questions. I'll just get our furniture all set. So friends, I'll sit in this one. And then if you want to sit in these two, then I'll grab our questions. Red. And we need to hold them nice and close, like an ice cream. <laughs> there will be ice cream later today, just not right now. <laughs> So today I've invited a couple of people to share some of their story with us. If you've heard um, or you've seen in our advertising for Easter that this Palm Sunday we're talking about a disrupted present and this sense that when Jesus comes into our life, things change. Life changes. And so I've invited Peter and Kay to just tell us a little bit about life and basically their salvation story and how life has changed because of Jesus. So, Pete, we'll start with you. Do you just want to give us a bit of an idea about what life was like before you became a Christian? It, um, it's not difficult. There's so many words I could put into it, but I'll shorten it all up. I, I, was, 45 year, I, I was 45 years old and pre-45 years old, um, anything that I felt... Uh, love, hate, any feelings that entered my life, my response was to gamble. And I became a binge compulsive gambler. And um, my, uh, my first marriage, even though I, uh, I keep blaming things on other people, I gambled out of my first marriage and my first son. I gambled out of my first business. I gambled out of my first life right up until I was um, 45, my response to the world was, I can't cope, I'm gambling. Wow. Wow, that's some honesty, isn't it? Thank you for sharing that. So any big emotion, love, hate, fear, what have you, the outlet was gambling. That was a safe outlet in that life. Wow. And so, so we might stick with you, Pete. So then... How did you come to know Jesus? What, what was it that was the turning point? In 2000, I actually, I, um, I ran a business in this building and... Um, yeah, in this very building. In this very building. And I ran it quite successfully. And because I ran it quite successfully, I had access to a lot of um, money and and um, so because of my gambling, I, I started to play with the money and fiddle the books. And um, I, I, my life fell apart, basically, in 2000. Uh, Victoria, my wife, was working in the business. Well, I got fired. She got fired. My two kids were four and uh, three. And... Um, I got fired on the Friday, and on the Sunday, I left the home. The, the, the only way I could function at that time was to be by myself, and I ended up sharing, sharing in a place. But I started attending Gamblers Anonymous, and a particular Saturday, I was outside, um, I was, at, I was outside the Marrickville TAB, and I had just gone through all my money. I had nothing left, and um, and I share this in GA because this is how close I was. I was at the bus stop, and I walked to the edge of the road, and there there was a bus coming up the road, and I and I thought, I seriously thought, I can just take one step, and it's all over. Or I looked up in the sky and says, God, help me. And for some reason, um, I took a step back, and. Yeah. I ended up um, within a couple of days in, in the Salvation Army Bridge Program. Wonderful. Wow. So that was rock bottom. That was, rock yeah, 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 desperate times. 
we're very thankful that you took that step back, even when things were very bleak. Thank God for the Salvation Army Bridge Program, and uh, yeah, which does very good work in recovery services. So Kay, your story is different. Everyone has a story, and they're always different. Yes. So tell us what life was like for you before you became a Christian. My life was a complete utter mess. I was married and my then husband was a gambler and he just meant everything. Anyhow, I ended up getting divorced, met somebody else and had a child. I had one a child to my first husband and then I had another child and she was born deaf. And... I just was a mess. I just didn't know where to turn. I was just working all the time and trying to get on with life. And then a couple of ladies came to my place, which I think a couple of the ladies here have heard the story. And I'm not saying what nomination they were coming from, but anyhow, they come to my place and they said to me, knocked on the door and I invited them in and said they were uh, coming to speak to me about my daughter that was handicapped. And... She said to me, is she deaf? And I said, yes. And they were, and I made them a cup of tea and everything like that. And then all of a sudden they turned around and said to me, do you know why she's deaf? I said, well, I've been told the doctors have said they're undeveloped ner- nerves. And they, and they said to me, have you ever considered it's your sin that your baby is deaf? And I turned around and said, if that's what your God is about... Or what, that's what God's about. I don't want any part of it. Why would they put this on my daughter for the sins that I've committed? And I guess I have, we're all sinful, you know, but I've committed a lot of sins. And so I brought that with me for years. You carried that? I carried it because when something is planted in your brain mm. or something is said, you think it. Yes. So then I'm, a long story short, my daughter became quite famous in the swimming, mm. was competing, going to compete for the Commonwealth Games and we moved to Brisbane to train. And it was a place called Stones Corner and besides the house that we rented was an army hall and I used to listen, sit on the back steps and listen to the music every Sunday <laughs> and I felt a peace coming over me. And anyhow, some months later... I took myself off to the Salvos to, and it was at Carina at that stage. Mm. And that was in 1996. Okay. And I, so I kept going and, but I always felt when I walked in that I was never, ever good enough. I never felt that I should belong there. Mm. And it was related to this. Oh, or, and, what or, been and what I'd done in the yeah. past and everything else. Mm. And so, okay, I and I've an talked adher- about this. I came an, an and adherent. so, what was the turning point for you when you realised all the other Christians at church well, were just normal people? Well, were, were human themselves. I used to, <laughs> when I was there, and then I heard a little rumour that this couple that was in uniform had an affair, mm. and I thought to myself, "Hang on." I'm not, you know, I'm mm. human too. These people are human. Mm. And so, I'm, you know, they, they commit sins as well. Mm. Mm. So that was it, you know. And then I started to think, well, hang on, God does love me. Mm. And I am forgiven. Yes. Amen. But even then, it, it takes a long time mm. to really forgive yourself. Mm. Yeah, a so long Kay, time. what you've shared is quite incredible too. And I think it's important for me just to say that what was said to Kay in that lounge room about disability or tragedy, crisis, being connected to sin, we don't believe that, okay? So um, we... I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that interpretation of the scriptures. In fact, in the Gospels, it's very clear that there is no connection. There is no connection there. So that was the wrong thing to have been said to you. And I'm very sorry because words have power, don't they? And so when words are spoken and and when we believe them, if they're faulty or if they're not true, those things can do damage 
and can ha- and even harmful. now I still think sometimes you know like yeah it, it's when something's brought up it comes all back to you you know mm. so Kay how did life change for you when you slowly did the journey and you you learnt more about Jesus and you started worshiping in yeah, a church and then I became and a soldier here at the yes school. yes and um, now I've got peace you've got peace. I've got peace I know that I've the Lord loves me mm. and I know particularly in my journey now with my health and um, my daughter what she's gone through and I just I just know that he's there I mm. I just have perfect peace so there's a peace that you there's have now peace, yeah. that you didn't sense no. before it's taken mm. me a long while but it is you know mm. I just have peace yeah so good so Pete for you what changed once you came into a relationship with God? Well, after I did, after I did the bridge program, I, um, I, I was still searching. I needed more than, more than just the bridge program. So I tried, uh, for almost three years, I tried a, a lot of Catholicism, did nothing for me, and I tried a year of of, of of Buddhism, I need spiritual. I needed spirituality in my life. It didn't work. But in the, after three years, in about two thousand and three, Victoria and the family realised that I was actually changed. I was a changed man, and they they invited me back into their life. Yeah, wow. And when they invited me back into their life, I was back here at Norellan, and for weeks I was fighting the. The, the urge to come into this building because I this building was had a lot of terrible memories. So in the meantime, the Salvation Army had moved in here. It was no longer in the, the meantime, store that it was. The Salvation yep. Army was here, but somehow while while the kids and my wife went to the Catholic Mass, I said no, I have to go to the Salvos today. I walked in the door and I was greeted by very special person in my life. I, I, I don't think he'd mind mentioning his name. Mm. Owen Miles mm. st- stretched his hand out to me and gave me a hug and went, welcome. And I went, oh, my God. Mm. <laughs> yeah, wow. And that, that began 21 years now of Gamble Free. Hallelujah. Um, <laughs> when, when all emotions come... I, I give them to God. I talk about them. Um, there have been a lot of heavy things happening, and I've always given it to God. Um, if I can mention, I, I've had a, a benign tumour cut out of my yeah. back, and through the power of the church praying and me praying, God has brought me through. God has changed my life immensely, and I would never, ever, ever want to go back to that old person yeah. that I was. So good. So good. Yeah, born again. So my final question to both of you. What would you say to people who are wondering about faith, wondering about Jesus, but are unsure about taking that step to actually become a Christian? What would you say to people or what would you have said to yourself all those years ago? What would you say? Either of you. I'd I'd like to say I... I searched internally. Uh, There was something happened, and I've had a lot of experiences in Gamblers Anonymous where people say, oh, but you can worship the painting, you can worship the, the, your dog, you can worship nature, you can worship, and I tried, but that just did not work. Mm. I had to understand, and I had to feel God, and God reached his hand out through people, and people so loving and so caring and so un- non-judgmental. Mm-hmm. Uh, there was a time that I was embarrassed to walk around Norellan, but now I walk with my head up high because yeah, I have God good. with me. Yeah. And, uh, and that's, it happened internally. So I would say search within and mm-hmm. God's there. Mm-hmm. That's good. How about you, Kay? What would you say? I to would people? say, do you want peace? Yeah. God loves you. And he forgives sins. And just, he's answered all my prayers. Mm. 
or so many of them. Mm. Might not be in my time, yeah. but his time, and nine times out of ten, it's right. Yeah. <laughs> well, ten out of ten, really. Yeah. You know. But I would just say to people, coming from a non-Christian home and not having any Christian brought, like, yeah, upbringing. It's, yeah, upbringing that's what I would say. Just mm. if you want peace and love, mm. and I have to say too, since I come into the army, I've made so many beautiful friendships. Mm. I feel loved by you. Mm. I, yeah, I just. It's wonderful. Yeah. Praise the Lord. I'd like to pray for these beautiful people and thank you sincerely. What you've offered us today by sharing your story is a real gift and has been a real blessing. Let me pray. Father God, we are so grateful for Kay and for Peter, and we've only heard just a taster of their life story and of your goodness and your faithfulness to them. And we can trace your hand at work through their lives, Lord, and we see how as you do with each of us, you are drawing people to yourself because you love us, God. You want to be in relationship with us. You want us to live fully and with freedom and wholeness and fullness of life. And so I thank you for that turning point in Peter's life and thank you for the way that he can now walk with his head held high. Thank you for the way you've restored his marriage and restored his family life and uh, that he's working again and that he's found a healthy way, a different way when those big emotions come, Lord. We say thank you. Thank you for this example and thank you that he's been so courageous in sharing this story. Continue to bless him, bless his family life and, uh, yeah, continue to reveal yourself to him. And for Kay, Lord, we thank you that she responded to that that music, that, um, that drawing of herself to you and to God's people. Thank you for the warm welcome that she received. Thank you for the peace that she now experiences, that perfect peace, that shalom that can be found in you, God. Would you bless her family? We think particularly of Cindy Lou and the way that she has flourished and lived life to the full, and in so much so because of the path that her mother paved for her. So bless her family and continue to reveal yourself to her as well. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. What a difference a personal relationship with Jesus makes to your life. Mm. And um, thank you for our friends for sharing. Yeah. It does us good, doesn't it, to hear our own personal experiences. You're going to sing a song with that name, What the Lord Has Done in Me. If you join us. Just stand, please.
Jesus, our risen Saviour. Thank you that you loved us so much that the punishment that brought us peace was upon you. And so we, Lord, you gave your life. What more could we give? And so we too want to give you our life. We want to surrender ourselves to you. And so, as we hear the reading of the word just now, Lord, may we have ears to hear what the Spirit is saying to the church, and may we have the courage and the willingness to obey. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Kendall. The Bible reading uh, this morning is taken from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21. If you have your Bibles, you can follow verses 1 to 11. This is the New International Version. Matthew 21, 1 to 11. As they approached Jerusalem and came to Bethpage on the Mount of Olives, Jesus sent two disciples saying to them, Go to the village ahead of you. And at once you will find a donkey there, tied there, with her colt by her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, tell them that the Lord needs them, and he will send them right away. This took place to fulfil what was spoken through the prophet. Say to the daughter of Zion, see, your king comes to you, gentle and riding on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. The disciples went and did as Jesus had instructed them. They brought the donkey and the colt, placed their cloaks on them, and Jesus sat on them. A very large crowd spread their cloaks on the road, while others cut branches from the trees and spread on the road. The crowds that went ahead of him and those that followed shouted. Now, I'd like you to take part with this. Hosanna! Hosanna. To the son of David. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. 
Hosanna in, the Hosanna in the highest. When Jesus entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred and asked, Who is this? The crowds answered, This is Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. May God bless that reading to us as we um, ponder his words. Thank you. Thank you, Kendall. I love creativity. That was great. I'm going to give you a bit of a glimpse into our family life. Every summer, my family, our family, heads north to the sunny Gold Coast for a beachside holiday. Has anyone done one of those Gold Coast trips with the family? Yeah? Yeah, some people, some people over the years, over the years. Okay. Okay. Now, we've made this annual pilgrimage for the last 30-plus years. For as long as I can remember, our summer holiday has been to the Gold Coast. Three generations are there, grandparents, parents and children. And over the years, we have worked out the best places to go, our favourite things to do, and our must-have things to eat. And so, with great confidence, I can already tell you that next summer, when we head to the Gold Coast, we will spend most mornings at the beach, we will spend a day at the shopping outlets, we will see a movie, the kids will do stand-up paddleboarding, we will go to the weekend markets, we will eat gelato from the award-winning gelato shop, and we will eat pizza at least twice from Earth and Sea. Sound like a, sound like a good, good holiday? These, what I've just listed off, are some of the fixtures... These are the patterns that have been repeated. These are the places and experiences and tastes that we look forward to. And believe me when I say that if we don't go to the shopping outlets or if we don't eat pizza at least twice, there will be tantrums. (laughs) And that's just me. Love my pizza. (laughs) It was genuinely surprising to me when another friend shared their holiday photos on social media and it said, this was a few years ago now, and it said something to the effect of, it's been a great family holiday, we are looking forward to going somewhere different next time. And I was like, ah, right. Some of us prefer routine. Some of us would rather stick to what's familiar and what is known. But then there are some of us who prefer change. Some of us who would rather venture out into the new and explore what is unknown. Now, this is not about right or wrong. I'm not going to ask you to sit on the left or the right-hand side of the room. It is just different, isn't it? Just different preferences. And of course, life is made up of both, of both the familiar and the unfamiliar. We can never have it just one way or the other. Life is full of things that are predictable and things that are uncertain. There is a need for routine and There is a need for change. On the day that Jesus entered Jerusalem, the Jews were preparing for one of the most important seasons on their religious calendar, the Passover, which leads into the Festival of Unleavened Bread. Every year, tens of thousands of people would make the pilgrimage to the holy city, the city of David, to celebrate Passover in remembrance of how God had saved his people from slavery and oppression in Egypt. And so pilgrims from all over Israel would travel 
to Jerusalem. The Lord's Passover would be observed in the first month of the Jewish year. For us, that's March, April. Every household was to slaughter and then eat a lamb, together with bitter herbs and bread made without yeast. So every year, the location was the same, the timing was the same, the meal was the same. The story of the very first Passover would be told and retold. The great exodus from Egypt when God rescued his people from captivity. And so every year the story of God's salvation was the same. The scriptures were the same. The prayers and the blessings over the meal were the same. A year old male lamb without defect, was to be sacrificed and then prepared in a particular way before being consumed. The bitter herbs, well, they were symbolic. They represented the bitter suffering in Egypt. And the bread without yeast, that was a reminder that they fled Egypt in haste. So every year, The requirements of the law were the same. The rituals were the same. The sacrifices were the same. And yet, this year, the year that we've read about today, this year would be unlike any other. This Passover would be different from all the rest. Why? Because the presence of Jesus changed things presence of Jesus changed things. Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem set off a chain of events that could not be stopped. The fuse was now lit. The city was now stirred. Jesus' true identity as Messiah, the Son of God, had been revealed and life could not go back to how it was before. Life had been irreversibly disrupted. And this happens from time to time in our life. Sometimes things happen, and actually we've heard some of this described today, sometimes things happen and we know in that moment that my life will never go back to the way that it was before. Whether it's a milestone event like the birth of a child or a wedding or a new job, a big move, or whether it's some kind of crisis or unforeseen tragedy like a car accident or a loss of a loved one, trauma, marriage breakdown, things will happen in life. Life can be irreversibly disrupted for better or for worse. My mum tells the story that on the night, and she's not here so I can embarrass her, (laughs) she can thank me later when she watches online. My mum tells the story that on the night that she and dad first went out for dinner, She went home, sat on the end of her flatmate's bed and said, I don't think my life is ever going to be the same again. I don't think my life is ever going to be the same again. Now, these sorts of landmark events don't happen all the time. We won't have life-changing encounters with people every day of the week. That would be exhausting. (laughs) But there will be those events and there will be those people and we will be changed forever because of them. Now, for those of us who profess to be Christians, many of us will talk about Jesus this way. That when Jesus came into my life, I knew that life would be different. That I would never be the same again. 
That is not the same as saying life will be easy. There's a difference. But life would never be the same. And that's because the presence of Jesus changes things. The presence of Jesus changes us. Praise God. It was retired General John Gowans who penned the words, I believe in transformation. God can change the hearts of men. God can change our hearts. Friends, when we are in relationship with Jesus, his refining presence changes us from the inside out. And over time, we start to want different things. We start to choose different things. We start to say different things. Because the status quo cannot remain because Jesus brings transformation and renewal. Yes, amen. Life as we know it is disrupted. And Jesus had already changed the lives of so many people in the months and years leading up to this triumphal entry into Jerusalem. Those living in the city of Jerusalem may not have known who he was. They were the ones saying, who is this? Who is this? But Jesus was very well known in the areas in which he'd been traveling and ministering for about three years. He wasn't a nobody. Jesus had an impressive reputation by now and had developed quite a following, especially in Galilee. Jesus had performed miracles of multiplication and of healing, giving sight to the blind and raising the dead. These stories were being passed on. There were witnesses to these signs. The word was out and so there was a palpable hype and a frenzied curiosity wherever Jesus went. A little bit like the Taylor Swift type that Sydney and Melbourne has just experienced. A little bit like that, but different. <laughs> For Jesus, some wanted to hear him, others wanted to silence him. Some wanted to follow him, others wanted to stop him. Some wanted to live for him, others wanted to kill him. But they could all agree on something. Change was coming. Disruption was inevitable. Those who loved Jesus and those who hated him sensed that life could not go back to the way it was. And they were right, weren't they? They were right. Life would never be the same again. History would prove that the world would never be the same again. 2,000 years later, we are still talking about Jesus, the prophet from Nazareth in Galilee. And if that was all he was, merely a prophet, merely a good man, we wouldn't even know his name all these years later. He was much more than that. Catherine Booth was one of the co-founders of the Salvation Army together with her husband, William. Catherine wrote the wildly popular statement in her book, Aggressive Christianity, that says this, there is no improving the future without disturbing the present. You might have come across that quote before. It's this idea that a better tomorrow may only be possible through disruption today. And we see this idea woven into the DNA of the Salvation Army, especially in its early years. An enthusiastic group of fiery Christians who lived to win the world for Jesus because they were convinced that the presence of Jesus would not just change the world, but save the world. And so these early salvos were pivotal 
in raising the age of consent from 13 to 16 in 19th century England. And they innovated matchsticks made with safe phosphorus to overthrow the abhorrent companies that were using hazardous phosphorus and putting the lives of all their workers at risk. And they did all this because there was no improving the future without disturbing the present. They worked for justice, they worked for equality, they spoke up for those who could not speak for themselves because they knew that Jesus would change things, that he was the hope of the world. Now, lots of people are familiar with that quote of Catherine Booth. People put it at the bottom of their email signatures and this kind of thing. But it has far more gravitas when heard in full. And so now I'm going to give you the full quote. Catherine Booth said, There is no improving the future without disturbing the present. The difficulty is to get people to be willing to be disturbed. The difficulty is to get people to be willing to be disturbed. Friends, as we head into Holy Week, this sacred week on the Christian calendar, I want us to ask ourselves the question, am I willing for life as I know it to be disturbed? If I long for a better tomorrow, am I willing for my life to be disrupted? Even though it might be hard, are we willing to change? Even though it might be painful, even though it might be costly, even though it might be uncomfortable, and it probably will be, are we willing? Are we willing? A better tomorrow may only be possible through disruption today. When I think about our world, a better tomorrow may only be possible through disruption today. When I think about life personally for you and for me, a better tomorrow, a bright future may only be possible if something changes today. Will we invite Jesus into our heart, even if that means something needs to change? So I'd like us to wrestle with those questions this morning while the familiar melody of Amazing Grace plays. As we wrestle with those questions, I just draw your attention to our mercy seats this morning. If anyone feels the need to come forward for prayer, you are more than welcome to the mercy seat, to the holiness table. Let's not wait until tomorrow to change things because a better tomorrow may only be possible by inviting Jesus to come into our life today. Let's wrestle with this just now as the Spirit is at work in our midst.
just now. We need to be in prayer. Let's not waste these moments to give our life to Jesus. Worship team, I'd like you to come and join us. Ruth, I would like you to take the microphone to Peter. Peter, I'd like you to lead us in prayer. Peter Dolan, I'd like you to lead us in prayer along these lines, Pete. Thank you. Father, we thank you for the wonderful good news that Jesus lives and reigns and is coming again. Yes. We thank you that we have the victory in Jesus. Father, we thank you that you so loved the world, you gave to save your best, your only son. And it didn't just stay on the cross. Jesus, you rose from the dead. Triumphant over the grave. And you're coming again. Hosanna. And we look forward to your presence. Lord, we know you're here. You said you would be because you said in your word, Lo, I'm with you always until the end of the age. And that is the word of a gentleman of the highest order. Yes. Jesus is here. Lord, our precious Savior, we welcome your presence. We worship you and we love you and we need you so much. And we pray this in your awesome name. Amen. Amen. Let's sing from the beginning. I invite you to stand as we make this our declaration. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Amazing grace. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me.
Thank you, Jesus, for saving us. Thank you that your presence has changed our life and changed our world, and we will never be the same again. Come, Lord Jesus. Amen. To conclude our time of worship, we're going to sing an amazing song that the uh, church has known for a long time, and can it be? that I should gain an interest in the Saviour's blood. And I looked this up this week and I, I read that um, John Wesley wrote this to celebrate his, confu- sorry, his conversion. Yeah. And um, so as we sing the song, you will see that there is a progress right through to when, you know, he realises that his, his, his life's been changed. And, um, and as you sing, uh, you will realise, come to see, um, there's no condemnation yeah, and that we are with Jesus and we're set free. Join us in singing. <laughs>
benediction from Romans. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing and perfect will. The Lord bless you as you invite Jesus more and more into your life as things change and he brings about transformation. He goes with us. We'll see you next week. We'll see you for lunch. And uh, we're looking forward to doing this Easter journey together. Amen. Bless you.